So Kelly, I, I'm totally thrilled to have you on today. And I I invited you on the show for a specific reason. I, I know you do a lot of speaking and a lot of writing on the topic of how to talk to people and how to lead people who aren't like you. Yeah. And I think that's an intriguing topic. So can you talk a little bit about why you became interested in even talking about this or writing about it? Sure. Um, prior to becoming a full-time professional speaker, I worked in the advertising agency industry, working for global ad agencies on big, big, big accounts. And one of the things that you do when you work for an ad agency is you do a lot of research for your clients to prepare them for the strategies that you're going to recommend and things like that. And I was living in Texas at the time, and the demography in Texas was changing rapidly between 1990 and 2000, between 2000 and 2010 the growth of the Hispanic population accelerated. And at that time, one in three people who lived in Texas were Hispanic. And as a marketing person, I knew that once we had the census numbers in 2000, I know it seems like a hundred years ago, but once we had the census numbers in 2000, things were gonna change and that advertisers, brands, marketers, and companies and organizations that wanted to grow their business, that here was an audience that they could tap into that they likely had not tapped into before. And so sure enough, you know, the numbers come out. We now we've got data and the phone is ringing and companies are calling and saying, do we need to make Dulce de Leche Cheerios? And literally, and uh, what kind of jeans do Hispanic men like to wear, et cetera. So what I learned at that time was when we're working with people who are just like us, we don't have the lens of how the world really, really is. And so when we start adding in people not like us, it actually strengthens business, it strengthens profit, it strengthens innovation and creative thinking. And so that's where it kind of started. And I didn't want to limit it to race, ethnicity, age, generational differences, gender, sexual identification. So I just called it people not like you. I love it. I love the way you frame that. You know, it's interesting as someone who grew up in another country, right? So I'm, I, I grew up in Greece and I went to an international school. And so I feel like I was socialized around people who are not like me, right? So everybody kind of just blended in and, and learned that. But, you know, you, you mentioned this concept that we always use in organizations, diversity, right? Yeah. How would you define diversity? My definition of diversity is any way that you can be different from me. So an example that I use that's really understandable and relatable for a lot of people is I do not have children. Okay. I've just never had kids. And um, most women my age have kids. And so I could find another woman or, you know, and say, okay, we could be the same race. We can be the same age. We could live in the same zip code. We could even make the same household income, like check, 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 check. Demographically, we would look the same, but if you have kids and I don't, we're really gonna be different. Like the pressures and priorities on someone who's a parent are very different than someone like me. I don't have those same pressures and priorities. And that is a way that we can be different from another that's fundamentally different. It has nothing to do with demography per se. And that's why I wanted to broaden the lens of conversations about diversity to encompass any way you can be different than me. People that are listening or watching right now could say, okay, you know, here they are, there's two white women, blonde, having this conversation, they're very alike, right? right. Imagine that on the surface, that may be true, but I bet that there, there are a lot of differences that you and I have, right? I mean, I grew up in Greece, I, I, where you grew Absolutely. up. Absolutely, right? and I can't tell that by looking at you. Right, you immediately yeah. we formed this impression that, oh, this person's like me. And so you right. should actually assume that most people aren't like you. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly it. Level. I mean, I yeah. feel like the diversity conversations, especially where they started, you know, 10, 15 years ago, were very surfacey. Yeah. Like, and what I call our envelope. All right. So you can look at me and you can tell that I'm a middle aged woman. I'm white. You know, I live in a house or, you know, whatever. You can tell these things by looking at my envelope. Right. right. And I can look at somebody else and say, oh, they're younger than me or they're older than me. Or you can look at someone who's disabled and maybe you can see that disability. Maybe you can't. But, you know, perhaps they're in a wheelchair. So those are things that are our envelope. And what I like to do is go below or go beyond the, the envelope into, frankly, what really makes us different 
you know, a morning person is different than a night owl. And I had a leader, I had a leader come up to me after a conversation at a, at a conference. He said, you know, when you said that about night owls and morning people, he said, I start all of the meetings that I have with my team at nine o'clock in the morning. He goes, I'm not going to do that anymore. He goes, I'm going to set them for like 10 30 or 11. Hmm. And I said, right, because if you want your team to be at their best, your night owls are not at their best at nine, but they're probably at their best around late morning. Yeah. So what difference does it make what time you have the meeting? Just have the meeting when everyone can bring their A game. You know, we keep in organizations, you know, obviously I work with a lot of organizations and there's all these buzz, buzzwords, right? right. Um, one of them now is inclusivity. Right. Um, and which is a very important concept. It's more important actually than diversity. Right. And so, but that I think is what you're talking about here yeah. is, you know, how, how do you become more inclusive rather than just talk about it? Right. Right. And I want to explain my comment about it's more important than diversity because it, it, that could be easily misunderstood is yeah. diversity is important and, and HR teams and companies have done a great job over the last 10, 15 years of making teams more diverse, bringing in different kinds of workers with different backgrounds, different perspectives, all the things that we need. That's where it starts. But if those individuals who can contribute those different perspectives do not have a voice in that organization, all you've done is populate the team with right. different kinds of people. You haven't tapped in to what they can bring to that team and what they can bring to the products and services and customers and uh, you know the whole reason that your business exists. And so that's why inclusivity is now the big focus. And what I am working with and when I'm working consulting with companies is Let's put sort of diversity over here. Let's park it. We're not dismissing it. Let's just park it over here right now and talk about people and culture. Yes. Because that's the part where companies are like, we want to do better and be better. And that's language that everybody can get behind. But that tends to be focused around people and culture because their products are going to be what they're going to be. And they can always you know, innovate and make their products better and all that kind of stuff and the services that they provide. The people and culture part is the part where you can really make differences that give you a competitive edge yes. that smoke your competition. You know, that's where that's where the magic is. I think that's what you talk about. You know, you you practically offer tips and solutions and the how of how to create that inclusive environment. When you talk about, you know, how do you work with and lead people like you? Right? <laughs> I mean, that that's what you're yeah. talking about is is not so much. I mean, diversity given, right? We are all diverse. Not the why anymore. We right. got it. We already, why is important. Say more we about that. Say, say more about that. Because I think that's such an important point. Diversity conversations, uh, again, I'm going to give HR departments all around the world the credit because they were the first ones who, you know, looked out at this 10 years, you know, 10 years out, um, not 10 years ago, but like when they were looking at this 15, 20 years ago, they were looking 10 years out and going, we need to diversify our workforce. But what happened is there had to be an education across the board with not only workers, but with leadership, with CEOs about why this was important. And so that's where those conversations started with why, why do we need to change things? And it, it was important conversation to have because especially if a company is profitable and successful, then their whole mindset is often, why would we change anything? It's working, you know, <laughs> why would we change anything? And so diversity conversations started there about like the importance of it and why it could benefit an organization. There's been a lot on that for more than 15 years now. But now what I'm finding, and especially as a white woman, because other white people will share this with me, they'll share their pain point or their anxiety or their trepidation point where they'll say, I totally get how important this is and I want to do better and be better. I want to do the right thing. I'm all in but I'm so afraid of saying the wrong thing or having what I say taken the wrong way. And I can't risk that. So I would rather just say nothing, right? We were never taught how to have these conversations and how to be inclusive and how to be respectfully inclusive and how to be respectful when I very much differ with your opinion and I have a very much different perspective, et cetera. You know, we were never taught those skills. And so, I think for everybody, it's it's a struggle, but for white people, it's extremely trouble, troubling and, and, and very nerve wracking for them because they want to get it right and they literally don't know how. And so how is always a skill. Skills can be taught. That's the beautiful thing about skills. There was a time when you didn't know how to drive. 
a lot of how we behave uh, is unconscious, right? It comes from unconscious biases that we have, the way we're socialized. You know, you were socialized somewhere. I was socialized somewhere. I came to the United States and I had a lot of uh, unconscious biases about just living in the U.S., right? Americans, yeah. 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 Even though my father's American, right? I mean, I've been in an American family, but still there there's stuff going on how do you how do you factor that in to the skill you know it's, it's the mindset shift as well rather than just the behavior shift because you can shape change behavior but if your mindset is the same it's there's a an off right i mean there's it, it's off it, it it's intentional mm-hmm. so unconscious bias is actually very well worded i mean we don't you know, we're not thinking right. about it, but, and the example that I always give an audience is because I, I like to take race and ethnicity off the table. Cause that can get a little sticky, you know? Yeah. And so I'll take something benign, like right. a trucker. And I'll say, pretend you're a trucking company and you need a trucker. You got a position for a trucker. They have to have 20 years ex- of experience and a, and a flawless safety record. Okay. Right. So you're interviewing and I say, close your eyes and imagine that trucker candidate coming in. And then I'll put up a picture of a trucker who looks like he's, you know, a white guy, 58, ball cap, scruffy beard, you know, I mean, whatever it is, right? But we have like this image of a trucker, okay? And so I'll say, how many of you thought of somebody who looks like this, whatever race or whatever, but like the age and all that kind of stuff. And everybody's like nodding their head. And I'm like, but what if someone like this showed up? And I'll put a picture up of, you know, a 30 year old woman, okay? Well, maybe that doesn't work. 20 years of experience. Okay. 40 year old. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I, get, I get where you're going with it, right? No, but 38, okay. right? Yeah, 38 year old woman, 38 year old woman. And that's not what you expected, but that's the person who showed up at the interview. Right. Right. And that person has the 20 years of experience and that person has the safety record, whatever, but it's not what you expected. And it's not what you thought you were going to get. Right. It's Cause it's all unconscious. So if we're trying to be more conscious, and say, this person that I need on my team can be anybody, but the skills that I'm looking for, the perspective I'm looking for, the um, mindset that I'm looking for is this, we have to be open to that and that has to be intentional. I mean, it really does. You have to actually say, okay, this is the kind of person we've always hired, but there's other people out there, you know, And, and be intentional about that and say, what are we looking for? What are we looking for? We're looking for, new perspectives, new backgrounds that can that can move our business forward. And that might not look like what you've had in the past that moved your business to this point. I think this this point about being intentional and conscious is you've got to make the unconscious conscious. And you only do that intentionally. It doesn't just, you're not struck by some lightning bolt that, oh, wow, this is And different. you can teach your team this. Let me give you a real life example. A friend yeah. of mine uh, lives in a city where there's a really good high school. It's a public high school, but a really good, like everybody knows that if you come out of that high school, you went to a great school. Okay. And so he was telling me that after we started talking about this stuff and he was kind of broadening his perspective, he was telling me. Every time we've ever had a resume for an entry level person and we look at that resume and we see that they went to that school, we say, that's our guy. And we hire that person without even looking at the other resumes, without even, I mean, he was like, that's our guy. And he said, now I'm actually thinking that that's a really bad way of doing it because there might be somebody who happened to live in a different zip code and went to a different public school who is amazing and they're just dismissing that person primarily based on where they went to school. That has nothing to do with the person and their abilities and skills. I mean, sure, education, but like, you know, and he, he, he really had his eyes open to that. And he was like, we've really been doing this in this one track way. And guess what? Just because you went to that great school doesn't actually mean you're the best person. And in fact, he was like, some of them don't work out. You know? And I was like, well, you know. I love the way you give that example because that is is something that we have to intentionally practice right it's like okay you know let me look at this part of what i see a lot in organizations and we're seeing it in the world as well right is the division that we have right And, and how people are not as willing to become more intentional they're set in their ways and I'm going to do X and I don't care what you think. This is what I believe I'm being self, right. I'm being my authentic self or whatever, whatever, what excuses we make for ourselves. 
And what I'm noticing is that there's a key element missing and it's the R word, right? The whole notion of respect and just respecting each other. Yeah. Can you talk about how respect plays into this? Because I think it's such a fundamental piece of your work, the book that I read, and also your building trust in order to be able to do this. So can you talk a little bit about respect? Yeah, respect is where it's at. And you know, people feel it and they feel it when it's absent. And um, it's an easy thing to give, but it means a lot. So um, respect is where I think all conversations around business growth and team development start, which is what are we trying to do? What's the best way to do that? And who are the people that we need to help us move forward? Now, when we're talking to people who have a different point of view, come from a different background, see things differently, um, then there's sometimes that clash, right? We just don't see eye to eye. And to your point, some people are like, this is the way I am and I'm not bending for anybody. And, you know, sorry, I shouldn't put like some weird accent on that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but that inflexibility comes through sometimes where people, there's almost a self-righteous, like this is who I am. And you have every right to be who you are. You mm -hmm. really do. But the best teams and the best leaders are the ones who will say, I don't see your point of view. Please tell me more about that. And instead of putting that wall up where we're going, well, that's not how I, I don't agree. That's not how I think and th that it's about actually like kind of digging into the wall a little bit and saying, tell me more about that. And I see it differently. What I love, I teach people to stop saying agree to disagree and to say instead, I see it differently because agree to disagree is a conversation ender. Yes. If yes. I say to you, let's agree to disagree and you say yes, we're done. And we're, we still have all those pent up emotions in there. Absolutely. But yeah. we just agreed to just drop it. And I don't think that's good for business. So a better way is to say, I see it differently. Because if you say that to me, Kelly, I see it differently. I am going to say, well, tell me how you see it. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we still might, might not agree, but I'm going to know a whole lot more about what shaped your point of view. And so we don't, first of all, we don't always have to agree. But I think what we have to do is understand mm -hmm. and try to understand the other person's perspective. And the way that you get to that is by asking, simply asking, tell me more about that. Let's talk about that. I'm not seeing it the way that you're seeing it. Tell me more about how you see it, you know, and getting to that because sometimes there's a real gem in there that the other person never even considered. And that's what respect is about. Respect is not about shutting somebody down because they have a difference of opinion. Or they I see that I see what you're talking about like daily when I'm working with executive teams or would be sitting around a table and you know they're just shut down and people just mm -hmm. aren't offering their point of view and then they'll leave That's the meeting happens. right they leave the meeting and then what happens afterwards is they automatically start talking about what the, how they were not understood right, right. And what you're talking about is at least walk away having people feel understood rather and that's what than whatever the decision is. And that's what okay. inclusivity is. Inclusivity yes. is let me hear you. Let me hear what your thoughts are on this. You know, if you take a team that's inventing a new product, let's say like literally a, an, an innovation team, they don't agree on stuff. It goes through a million iterations and beta testing and like, oh, that's stupid. And what color should we make it? And you know, what should it cost and all this? There's a million disagreements along the way. But at the end of the day, a good team comes to here it is whatever it is that that product is, here it is. We figured it out and it was collaborative. So collaboration and inclusivity is to me, how you demonstrate respect. You can't just say the word. You can't say that's one of our core values. Well, what does that look like at work? It looks like having conversations. And sometimes those conversations are tough because people do get emotional. They do get, um, they feel passionate perhaps about their point of view and that's okay. You know, and so one thing I want to say, this is important about white people. Can I just say this? Is, um, well, you don't know what I'm going to say. So it's kind of, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's really important from a respect standpoint that when other people are sharing a point of view that especially might be um, something that's difficult to hear because people of color and people who have, um, who are not white or have other different backgrounds, et cetera, perhaps people who are marginalized, they often have different experiences that white people flat out don't have, mm -hmm. just don't have. And so it's extremely uncomfortable 
for us, I'm going to say us as white people, to hear some of those stories, because we know that those are stories that don't happen to us, and they're awful, right? And so what I find that a lot of white people do is it's so uncomfortable that we try to downplay it. We will say things like, well, that was a long time ago. You know, things are different now, right? Or, well, that was just a bad group of people you were working with. Not everybody's like that, right? I think that's really disrespectful. And here's why. Yeah. I think the experience that someone is sharing with you, particularly if it's a difficult experience, is a gift. That person is trusting you with a story and an experience that they have that probably shaped their perspective. We need to listen to that and we need to acknowledge the squirm. I think if we're squirming, we're getting somewhere. It's terribly uncomfortable. It's terribly uncomfortable to sit there and squirm and listen to someone tell a painful story. But that story matters, you know, and so I think respect is shown by listening to the good, the bad, the ugly, the ideas and and getting to that, you know, what does that bring to the table? What what life or business experience do you have that we need to hear about and then not refute it or downplay it when that is shared? And that's respect. Kelly, I can't tell you how that phrase is. I, I think it's just a gem of this whole conversation is acknowledge the squirm. That is, that's big. You're feeling it. We're getting, we're, we're getting. Some. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and why do you think there's that squirm? Because we don't have it. Yeah. We, and I say we as white people. So I'll give you an example. Um, my boxing coach um, is a black man. And his boxing gym is in a strip shopping center where there's like an Ace Hardware and, you know, Sally Beauty Supply and a Joanne Fabric. Okay, so just to like go to the demographic of what a Joanne buyer is, I'm going to say 65 years old, white woman going in to get an applique of a cat to sew onto her sweatshirt, right? Here's your, <laughs> there's your advertising demographic, which is probably stereotypical because it's probably an 18 year old making a Halloween costume, right? Well, yeah, maybe so. Yeah, but, right? but the point is we were yeah. talking, we talk a lot about race and uh, he was telling me one day that um, when he walks out of the gym and particularly at night when it's dark, um, that he can hear the doors locking in the parking lot. And that made me really uncomfortable. And I actually, I, I didn't follow my own advice. I actually pushed back on him and I was like, you don't mean the doors are locking, Randy. Like one lady locked her door. And he was like, no, Kelly, the doors were locking. And he goes, and it happens every day. And that made me so uncomfortable because that doesn't happen to my white male friends. It just doesn't. And I even pushed back on him even more because I was squirming so much and I said, Okay, so wait a second. Seriously, you're a 48 year old man. You're walking out of a gym. You're ripped to shreds. You're you're wearing workout clothes and you're carrying a duffel bag and you clearly just came from this gym. And he goes, I guess they think I'm going to carjack them. Uh -huh. And that's his reality. I've got a friend who's black and she works for a very um, conservative industry, financial services, and she started wearing her hair natural, you know. And um, so one day this woman, not a very nice woman on her, you know, whatever said, oh, you're wearing your hair natural now, you know, with that like really snotty, snide kind of, and she goes, yeah. And then there's this long pause and the woman said, are you gonna wear it to the, uh, like, are you gonna wear it like that to the meeting with the client on Friday? Now, has that ever happened to you? No. Has it ever happened to me? No. But this woman is saying, your hair is not okay. You know what I'm saying? That stuff makes me squirm. But it happens and we just and we need to we need to acknowledge it and sit in the squirm. I think that's and, and say thank you for sharing that with me. That's just awful. And I'm so sorry that that happened to you. Can't fix it, but we can acknowledge that they gave us a gift by sharing that story and saying that's really awful. I'm sorry that happened to you. You know, so that's all I I just want to say that I think especially at work, people try to avoid the squirm. I mean, the squirm's uncomfortable. But if you just sit in it, you're not going to die from it. And it, it's your gut instinct telling you that something's happening that's real. Yeah. Wow. I think I think the, uh, sitting in the squirm, I think, is, wow, what a takeaway from this conversation today. Because I think that in itself goes back to the respect. It goes back to the inclusivity. It goes back to curiosity. It goes back to all the things that we're talking about of how to work with and lead people not like you. What other parting words of wisdom and advice would you give to our listeners who are 
mostly leaders and organizations about this whole concept of how to work with people not like you? People are people. And if you're curious about someone, and I think, you know, you shared with me, you grew up in Greece. What a great jumping off point. I would be like, oh my gosh, how <laughs> long did you live in Greece? How old were you when you immigrated to the United States? And, you know, I mean, I would want to know all about that. The things that we can ask each other are okay. Can I, can I stop for a second? Yeah. And right there, right? I, you, I would break a stereotype. It's like, well, I didn't immigrate. My dad was in the military and I lived overseas. Right. And so right telling on. me that exactly. <laughs> See, so right. I only have a piece of the story. I only have one piece of the story and it was wrong. Right. right. But, <laughs> but the assumptions we make going, going right into it, right. Right off the bat. So that's I'm a great sorry. example. Go ahead. I mean, I just that was a great example. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and, and I thank you for stopping me and correcting me because that's a real life conversation. And I would say, when did you immigrate? And you'd say, well, I didn't. My dad was in the Air Force, you know, and I'd be like, oh, cool, military family, you know, like, did you move a lot, you know, and is that hard? And, you know, all those things that are so interesting. I think it's really important to just lean into the differences. And one of the ways, one of the easy ways to do that, this is a softball question, but it opens up so many doors is tell me about yourself. Because what I find is when you say, tell me about yourself, people will tell you what they think is important. And maybe where you were born is really not germane to anything. Maybe that's irrelevant, you know, but what they might say is, well, I've never been in this industry before and I made a career change and blah, you know, I mean, you never know where it's gonna go. Um, or I, you know, I, I actually just moved from this state to this state. I got a promotion with this company. And so, you know, you never know. But if you say, tell me about yourself, people will actually go, they'll lead with what they want you to know. And what they want you to know is a great jumping off point, which is like, you know, well, great. Well, tell me more about that. Tell me more about that. Tell me about yourself. Get somebody talking. That's the big tip is that you can have a diverse team, but if, unless you harness that talent and those and have those conversations that bring out the diversity of perspective, that's what we're really after. Then you're just having a bunch of people around you. I love it. I, I, that, I talk about words of wisdom that those are really great things to close with. And, and what I find so fascinating about this whole conversation is how all of this is connected to learning because we're all learning. And uh, we're all learning from each other. And I think that's a big piece of what you're talking about today is how to continue learning from each other. Yeah. And business has learned <laughs> that diversity of thought and diversity of perspective drives business profit, sales, customer satisfaction, innovation on every metric that business success is measured. All of that is driven forward by diversity of perspective and thought. And you only get that by having different kinds of people on your teams and surrounding yourself with different people. Thank you so much, Kelly, for this conversation. Again, like I said, I could keep talking to you. I think this is so important. And I think the people who are listening to this will find it really important too. Thank you. So I really appreciate you being here today and sharing. I appreciate all this. it.